the World Economic Forum has announced that by 2030, and you need to take these people seriously, folks, by 2030, all reproduction will be external to the human being. That's pretty interesting. Read the first three chapters of Brave New World to find out what the World Economic Forum has in store for you. Chapter 3 Outside in the garden, it was playtime. Naked in the warm June sunshine, six or seven hundred little boys and girls were running with shrill yells over the lawns, or playing ball games, or squatting silently in twos and threes among the flowering shrubs. The roses were in bloom. Two nightingales soliloquized in the boskage. A cuckoo was just going out of tune among the lime trees. The air was drowsy with the murmur of bees and helicopters. The director and his students stood for a short time watching a game of centrifugal bumble puppy. Twenty children were grouped in a circle round a chrome steel tower. A ball, thrown up so as to land on the platform at the top of the tower, rolled down into the interior, fell on a rapidly revolving disc, was hurled through one or other of the numerous apertures pierced in the cylindrical casing and had to be caught. Strange, mused the director as they turned away, strange to think that even in our Ford's day, most games were played without more apparatus than a ball or two and a few sticks, and perhaps a bit of netting. Imagine the folly of allowing people to play elaborate games which do nothing whatever to increase consumption. It's madness. Nowadays, the controllers won't approve of any new game unless it can be shown that it requires at least as much apparatus as the most complicated of existing games. He interrupted himself. That's a charming little group, he said, pointing. In a little grassy bay, between tall clumps of Mediterranean heather, two children, a little boy of about seven, and a little girl who might have been a year older, were playing very gravely and with all the focused attention of scientists intent on a labor of discovery, a rudimentary sexual game. Charming, charming, the DHC repeated sentimentally. Charming, the boys politely agreed, but their smile was rather patronizing. They had put aside similar childish amusements too recently to be able to watch them now without a touch of contempt. Charming? But it was just a pair of kids fooling about. That was all. Just kids. I always think, the director was continuing in the same rather maudlin tone, when he was interrupted by a loud boo-hooing. From a neighboring shrubbery emerged a nurse, leading by the hand a small boy who howled as he went. An anxious-looking little girl trotted at her heels. What's the matter? asked the director. The nurse shrugged her shoulders. Nothing much, she answered. It's just that this little boy seems rather reluctant to join in the ordinary erotic play. I'd noticed it once or twice before, and now again today. He started yelling just now. Honestly, put in the anxious-looking little girl, I didn't mean to hurt him or anything, honestly. Of course you didn't, dear, said the nurse reassuringly. And so, she went on, turning back to the director, I'm taking him to see the assistant superintendent of psychology, just to see if anything's at all abnormal. Quite right, said the director. Take him in. You stay here, little girl, he added, as the nurse moved away with her still howling charge. What's your name? Polly Trotsky. And a very good name, too, said the director. Run away now and see if you can find some other little boy to play with. The child scampered off into the bushes and was lost to sight. "'Exquisite little creature,' said the director, looking after her. Then, turning to his students, "'What I'm going to tell you now,' he said, "'may sound incredible. But then, when you're not accustomed to history, most facts about the past do sound incredible.' He let out the amazing truth. For a very long period before the time of our Ford, and even for some generations afterwards, erotic play among children had been regarded as abnormal. There was a roar of laughter, and not only abnormal, actually 
immoral. No, and had therefore been rigorously suppressed. A look of astonished incredulity appeared on the faces of his listeners. Poor little kids not allowed to amuse themselves? They could not believe it. Even adolescents, the DHC was saying, even adolescents like yourselves. Not possible. Barring a little surreptitious autoerotism and homosexuality, absolutely nothing. Nothing? In most cases, till they were over twenty years old. Twenty years old? echoed the students in a chorus of loud disbelief. Twenty! the director repeated. I told you that you'd find it incredible. But what happened? they asked. What were the results? The results were terrible. A deep resonant voice broke startlingly into the dialogue. They looked round. On the fringe of the little group stood a stranger, a man of middle height, black-haired, with a hooked nose, full red lips, eyes very piercing and dark. Terrible, he repeated. The DHC had at that moment sat down on one of the steel and rubber benches conveniently scattered through the gardens, but at the sight of the stranger he sprang to his feet and darted forward, his hand outstretched, smiling with all his teeth, effusive. Controller! What an unexpected pleasure! Boys, what are you thinking of? This is the controller! This is his fordship, Mustafa Mond! In the four thousand rooms of the center, the four thousand electric clocks simultaneously struck four. Discarnate voices called from the trumpet mouths. Main day shift off duty, second day shift take over, main day shift off. In the lift, on their way up to the changing rooms, Henry Foster and the assistant director of predestination rather pointedly turned their backs on Bernard Marx, from the Psychology Bureau, averted themselves from that unsavory reputation. The faint hum and rattle of machinery still stirred the crimson air in the embryo store. Shifts might come and go, one lupus-colored face give place to another, majestically and forever the conveyors crept forward with their load of future men and women. Lennon a crown walked briskly towards the door. His fordship, Mustafa Mond. The eyes of the saluting students almost popped out of their heads. Mustafa Mond, the resident controller for Western Europe, one of the ten world controllers, one of the ten. And he sat down on the bench with the DHC. He was going to stay, to stay, yes, and actually talk to them, straight from the horse's mouth straight from the mouth of Ford himself. Two shrimp-brown children emerged from a neighboring shrubbery, stared at them for a moment with large, astonished eyes, then returned to their amusements among the leaves. You all remember, said the controller in his strong, deep voice, you all remember, I suppose, that beautiful and inspired saying of our Fords, history is bunk. History, he repeated slowly, is bunk. He waved his hand, and it was as though, with an invisible feather whisk, he had brushed away a little dust, and the dust was Harappa, was Ur of the Chaldees, some spider webs, and they were Thebes and Babylon and Knossos and Mycenae. Whisk, whisk, and where was Odysseus? Where was Job? Where was Jupiter and Gotama and Jesus? Whisk, and those specks of antique dirt called Athens and Rome, Jerusalem and the Middle Kingdom, all were gone. Whisk, the place where Italy had been, was empty. Whisk, the cathedrals. Whisk, whisk, King Lear and the thoughts of Pascal. Whisk, passion. Whisk, requiem. Whisk, symphony. Whisk. Going to the Feelies this evening, Henry, inquired the assistant predestinator. 
I hear the new one of the Alhambra is first rate. There's a love scene on a bearskin rug. They say it's marvellous. Every hair of the bear reproduced. The most amazing tactual effects. That's why you're taught no history, the controller was saying. But now the time has come. The DHC looked at him nervously. There were those strange rumours of old forbidden books hidden in a safe in the controller's study. Bibles, poetry, Ford knew what. Mustafa Mond intercepted his anxious glance, and the corners of his red lips twitched ironically. It's all right, Director, he said in a tone of faint derision. I won't corrupt them. The DHC was overwhelmed with confusion. Those who feel themselves despised do well to look despising. The smile on Bernard Marx's face was contemptuous. Every hair on the bear indeed. I shall make a point of going, said Henry Foster. Mustafa Mond leaned forward, shook a finger at them. Just try to realize it, he said and his voice sent a strange thrill quivering along their diaphragms. Try to realize what it was like to have a viviparous mother. That smutty word again, but none of them dreamed this time of smiling. Try to imagine what living with one's family meant. They tried, but obviously without the smallest success. And do you know what a home was? They shook their heads. From her dim crimson cellar, Lennon a crown shot up seventeen stories, turned to the right as she stepped out of the lift, walked down a long corridor, and, opening the door marked Girls' Dressing Room, plunged into a deafening chaos of arms and bosoms and underclothing. Torrents of hot water were splashing into or gurgling out of a hundred baths. Rumbling and hissing, Eighty vibro-vacuum massage machines were simultaneously kneading and sucking the firm and sunburnt flesh of eighty superb female specimens. Everyone was talking at the top of her voice. A synthetic music machine was warbling out a super cornet solo. Hello, Fanny, said Lenina to the young woman who had the pegs and locker next to hers. Fanny worked in the bottling room, and her surname was also Crown. But as the two thousand million inhabitants of the planet had only ten thousand names between them, the coincidence was not particularly surprising. Lenina pulled at her zippers, downward on the jacket, downwards with a double-handed gesture at the two that held trousers, downwards again to loosen her undergarment. Still wearing her shoes and stockings, she walked off towards the bathrooms. Home! home, a few small rooms stiflingly over-inhabited by a man, by a periodically teeming woman, by a rabble of boys and girls of all ages, no air, no space, an under-sterilized prison, darkness, disease, and smells. The controller's evocation was so vivid that one of the boys, more sensitive than the rest, turned pale at the mere description and was on the point of being sick. Lenina got out of the bath, toweled herself dry, took hold of a long, flexible tube plugged into the wall, presented the nozzle to her breast, as though she meant to commit suicide, pressed down the trigger. A blast of warmed air dusted her with the finest talcum powder. Eight different scents and eau de cologne were laid on in little taps over the wash basin. She turned on the third from the left, dabbed herself with chypre, and, carrying her shoes and stockings in her hand, went out to see if one of the vibro-vacuum machines were free. And home was as squalid psychically as physically. Psychically, it was a rabbit hole, a midden, hot with the frictions of tightly packed life, reeking with emotion. What suffocating intimacies, what dangerous, insane, obscene relationships between the members of the family group. Maniacally, the mother brooded over her children, her children, 
brooded over them like a cat over its kittens. But a cat that could talk, a cat that could say, My baby, my baby, over and over again, My baby, and oh, oh, at my breast, the little hands, the hunger, and that unspeakable agonizing pleasure, till at last my baby sleeps, my baby sleeps with a bubble of white milk at the corner of his mouth. My little baby sleeps. Yes, said Mustafa Mond, nodding his head. You may well shudder. Who are you going out with tonight? Lennon asked, returning from the vibrovac like a pearl illuminated from within, pinkly glowing. Nobody. Lennon raised her eyebrows in astonishment. I've been feeling rather out of sorts lately, Fanny explained. Dr. Wells advised me to have a pregnancy substitute. But, my dear, you're only nineteen. The first pregnancy substitute isn't compulsory till twenty-one. I know, dear, but some people are better if they begin earlier. Dr. Wells told me that brunettes with wide pelvises, like me, ought to have their first pregnancy substitute at seventeen. So I'm really two years late, not two years early. She opened the door of her locker and pointed to the row of boxes and labelled files on the upper shelf. Syrup of Corpus Luteum. Lenina read the names aloud. Over in Guaranteed Fresh, not to be used after August the 1st, AF 632. Mammary gland extract, to be taken three times daily before meals with a little water. Placentin. 5 cc to be injected intravenally every third day. Oh, Lennon shuddered. How I loathe intravenals, don't you? Yes, but when they do one good. Fanny was a particularly sensible girl. Our Ford, or Our Freud, as for some inscrutable reason he chose to call himself whenever he spoke of psychological matters, our Freud had been the first to reveal the appalling dangers of family life. The world was full of fathers, was therefore full of misery, full of mothers, therefore of every kind of perversion from sadism to chastity, full of brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, full of madness and suicide. And yet, among the savages of Samoa, in certain islands off the coast of New Guinea, the tropical sunshine lay like warm honey on the naked bodies of children tumbling promiscuously among the hibiscus blossoms. Home was in any one of twenty palm-thatched houses. In the Trobrians, conception was the work of ancestral ghosts. Nobody had ever heard of a father. Extremes, said the controller, meet, for the good reason that they were made to meet. Dr. Wells said that a three-months pregnancy substitute now will make all the difference to my health for the next three or four years. Well, I hope he's right, said Lennon, but Fanny, do you really mean to say that for the next three months you're not supposed to... Oh, no, dear, only for a week or two, that's all. I shall spend the evening at the club playing musical bridge. I suppose you're going out. Lennon nodded. Who with? Henry Foster. Again? Fanny's kind, rather moonlike face took on an incongruous expression of pained and disapproving astonishment. Do you mean to tell me you're still going out with Henry Foster? Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. But there were also husbands, wives, lovers. There were also monogamy and romance. Though you probably don't know what those are, said Mustafa Mond. They shook their heads. Family, monogamy, romance. Everywhere exclusiveness. Everywhere a focusing of interest, a narrow channeling of impulse and energy. But everyone belongs to everyone else, he concluded, citing the hypnopedic proverb. The students nodded, 
emphatically agreeing with a statement which, upwards of 62,000 repetitions in the dark, had made them accept not merely as true, but as axiomatic, self-evident, utterly indisputable. But after all, Lenina was protesting, it's only about four months now since I've been having Henry. Only four months? I like that. And what's more, Fanny went on, pointing an accusing finger, there's been nobody else except Henry all that time, has there? Lenina blushed scarlet, but her eyes, the tone of her voice, remained defiant. No, there hasn't been anyone else, she answered almost truculently, and I jolly well don't see why there should have been. Oh, she jolly well doesn't see why there should have been, Fanny repeated, as though to an invisible listener behind Lenina's left shoulder. Then, with a sudden change of tone, But seriously, she said, I really do think you ought to be careful. It's such horribly bad form to go on and on like this with one man. At forty or thirty-five it wouldn't be so bad. But at your age, Lenina, no, it really won't do. And you know how strongly the DHC objects to anything intense or long-drawn. Four months of Henry Foster without having another man? Why, he'd be furious if he knew. Think of water under pressure in a pipe. They thought of it. I pierce it once, said the controller. What a jet! He pierced it twenty times. There were twenty piddling little fountains. My baby, my baby. Mother! The madness is infectious. My love, my one and only precious, precious. Mother, monogamy, romance. High spurts the fountain. Fierce and foamy the wild jet. The urge has but a single outlet. My love, my baby. No wonder these poor pre-moderns were mad and wicked and miserable. Their world didn't allow them to take things easily, didn't allow them to be sane, virtuous, happy. What with mothers and lovers, what with the prohibitions they were not conditioned to obey, what with the temptations and the lonely remorses, what with all the diseases and the endless isolating pain, what with the uncertainties and the poverty, they were forced to feel strongly, and feeling strongly, and strongly, what was more, in solitude, in hopeless individual isolation, how could they be stable? Of course, there's no need to give him up. Have somebody else from time to time, that's all. He has other girls, doesn't he? Lenina admitted it. Of course he does. Trust Henry Foster to be the perfect gentleman, always correct. And then there's the director to think of. You know what a stickler... Nodding, he patted me on the behind this afternoon, said Lenina. There, you see, Fanny was triumphant. That shows what he stands for, the strictest conventionality. Stability, said the controller. Stability. No civilization without social stability. No social stability without individual stability. His voice was a trumpet. Listening, they felt larger, warmer. The machine turns, turns, and must keep on turning forever. It is death if it stands still. A thousand millions scrabbled the crust of the earth. The wheels began to turn. In a hundred and fifty years there were two thousand million. Stop all the wheels. In a hundred and fifty weeks there are once more only a thousand millions. A thousand, thousand, thousand men and women have starved to death. Wheels must turn steadily, but cannot turn untended. There must be men to tend them, men as steady as the wheels upon their axles, sane men, obedient men, stable in contentment. Crying, my baby, my mother, my only, only love, groaning, 
My sin, my terrible God, screaming with pain, muttering with fever, bemoaning old age and poverty, how can they tend the wheels? And if they cannot tend the wheels, the corpses of a thousand, thousand, thousand men and women would be hard to bury or burn. And after all, Fanny's tone was coaxing, it's not as though there were anything painful or disagreeable about having one or two men besides Henry, and seeing that you ought to be a little more promiscuous. Stability, insisted the controller, stability, the primal and the ultimate need, stability. Hence, all this. With a wave of his hand, he indicated the gardens, the huge building of the conditioning centre, the naked children furtive in the undergrowth or running across the lawns. Lenina shook her head. Somehow, she mused, I hadn't been feeling very keen on promiscuity lately. There are times when one doesn't. Haven't you found that too, Fanny? Fanny nodded her sympathy and understanding. But one's got to make the effort, she said sententiously. One's got to play the game. After all, everyone belongs to everyone else. Yes, everyone belongs to everyone else, Lennon repeated slowly, and, sighing, was silent for a moment. Then, taking Fanny's hand, gave it a little squeeze. You're quite right, Fanny, as usual. I'll make the effort. Impulse arrested spills over, and the flood is feeling, the flood is passion, the flood is even madness. It depends on the force of the current, the height and strength of the barrier. The unchecked stream flows smoothly down its appointed channels into a calm well-being. The embryo is hungry. Day in, day out, the blood surrogate pump unceasingly turns its eight hundred revolutions a minute. The decanted infant howls. At once a nurse appears with a bottle of external secretion. Feeling lurks in that interval of time between desire and its consummation. Shorten that interval. Break down all those old, unnecessary barriers. Fortunate boys, said the controller. No pains have been spared to make your lives emotionally easy, to preserve you, so far as that is possible, from having emotions at all. Ford's in his flivver, murmured the DHC. All's well with the world. Lenin a crown, said Henry Foster, echoing the assistant predestinator's question as he zipped up his trousers. Oh, she's a splendid girl, wonderfully pneumatic. I'm surprised you haven't had her. I can't think how it is I haven't, said the assistant predestinator. I certainly will at the first opportunity. From his place on the opposite side of the changing room aisle, Bernard Marks overheard what they were saying and turned pale. And to tell the truth, said Lenina, I'm beginning to get just a tiny bit bored with nothing but Henry every day. She pulled on her left stocking. Do you know Bernard Marks? She asked in a tone whose excessive casualness was evidently forced. Fanny looked startled. You don't mean to say... Why not? Bernard's an Alpha Plus. Besides, he asked me to go to one of the savage reservations with him. I've always wanted to see a savage reservation. But his reputation... What do I care about his reputation? They say he doesn't like obstacle golf. They say, they say, mocked Lenina. And then he spends most of his time by himself, alone. There was horror in Fanny's voice. Well, he won't be alone when he's with me. And anyhow, why are people so beastly to him? I think he's rather sweet. She smiled to herself. How absurdly shy he had been, frightened almost, as though she were a world controller and he a gamma-minus machine-minder. 
"'Consider your own lives,' said Mustafa Mond. "'Has any of you ever encountered an insurmountable obstacle?' The question was answered by a negative silence. "'Has any of you been compelled to live through a long time interval "'between consciousness of a desire and its fulfilment? "'Well,' began one of the boys, and hesitated. "'Speak up!' said the DHC. Don't keep his fortship waiting. I once had to wait nearly four weeks before a girl I wanted would let me have her. And you felt a strong emotion in consequence. Horrible. Horrible, precisely, said the controller. Our ancestors were so stupid and short-sighted that when the first reformers came along and offered to deliver them from those horrible emotions... They wouldn't have anything to do with them. Talking about her as though she were a bit of meat. Bernard ground his teeth. Have her here, have her there, like mutton, degrading her to so much mutton. She said she'd think it over. She said she'd give me an answer this week. Oh, Ford, Ford, Ford. He would have liked to go up to them and hit them in the face, hard, again and again. Yes, I really do advise you to try her, Henry Foster was saying. Take ectogenesis. Fitzner and Kawaguchi had got the whole technique worked out. But would the government look at it? No. There was something called Christianity. Women were forced to go on being viviparous. He's so Ugly, said Fanny, but I rather like his looks. And then so small. Fanny made a grimace. Smallness was so horribly and typically low caste. I think that's rather sweet, said Lenina. One feels one would like to pet him, you know, like a cat. Fanny was shocked. They say somebody made a mistake when he was still in the bottle. Thought he was a gamma and put alcohol into his blood surrogate. That's why he's so stunted. What nonsense! Lenina was indignant. Sleep teaching was actually prohibited in England. There was something called liberalism. Parliament, if you know what that was, passed a law against it. The records survive. Speeches about the liberty of the subject. Liberty to be inefficient and miserable. Freedom to be a round peg in a square hole. But, my dear chap, you're welcome, I assure you. You're welcome. Henry Foster patted the assistant predestinator on the shoulder. Everyone belongs to everyone else, after all. One hundred repetitions three nights a week for four years, thought Bernard Marx who was a specialist on hypnopedia. Sixty-two thousand four hundred repetitions makes one truth. Idiots! Or the caste system. Constantly proposed, constantly rejected. There was something called democracy. As though men were more than physico-chemically equal. Well, all I can say is that I'm going to accept his invitation. Bernard hated them, hated them. But they were two, they were large, they were strong. The Nine Years' War began in AF 141. Not even if it were true about the alcohol in his blood surrogate. Phosgene, chloropicrine, ethyl iodoacetate, diphenylcyanacine, trichlormethyl, chloroformate, dichloroethyl sulfide, not to mention hydrocyanic acid, which I simply don't believe, Lenina concluded. The noise of 14,000 aeroplanes advancing in open order. But in the Kofurstendam, 
and the 8th arrondissement, the explosion of the anthrax bombs is hardly louder than the popping of a paper bag. Because I do want to see a savage reservation. CH3 sub 3, C sub 6, H sub 2, left parenthesis, NO sub 2, right parenthesis, sub 3, plus HG, left parenthesis, C, NO, right parenthesis, sub 2, equals, well, what? An enormous hole in the ground, a pile of masonry, some bits of flesh and mucus, a foot with a boot still on it, flying through the air and landing flop in the middle of the geraniums, the scarlet ones. Such a splendid show that summer. You're hopeless, Lenin. I give you up. The Russian technique for infecting water supplies was particularly ingenious. Back turn to back, Fanny and Lenina continued their changing in silence. The Nine Years' War, the great economic collapse. There was a choice between world control and destruction, between stability and... Fanny Crown's a nice girl, too said the assistant predestinator. In the nurseries, the elementary class consciousness lesson was over. The voices were adapting future demand to future industrial supply. I do love flying, they whispered. I do love flying. I do love having new clothes. I do love... Liberalism, of course, was dead of anthrax, but all the same you couldn't do things by force. Not nearly so pneumatic as Lenina, oh, not nearly. But old clothes are beastly, continued the untiring whisper. We always throw away old clothes. Ending is better than mending. Ending is better than mending. Ending is better. Government's an affair of sitting, not hitting. You rule with the brains and the buttocks, never with the fists. For example, there was the conscription of consumption. There, I'm ready, said Lenina. But Fanny remained speechless and averted. Let's make peace, Fanny, darling. Every man, woman, and child compelled to consume so much a year in the interests of industry. The sole result... Ending is better than mending. The more stitches, the less riches. The more stitches. One of these days, said Fanny with dismal emphasis, you'll get into trouble. Conscientious objection on an enormous scale. Anything not to consume. Back to nature. I do love flying. I do love flying. Back to culture. Yes, actually to culture. You can't consume much if you sit still and read books. Do I look all right? Lenina asked. Her jacket was made of bottle green acetate cloth with green viscous fur at the cuffs and collar. Eight hundred simple lifers were mowed down by machine guns at Golders Green. Ending is better than mending. Ending is better than mending. Green corduroy shorts and white viscous woolen stockings turned below the knee. Then came the famous British Museum massacre. Two thousand culture fans gassed with dichloroethyl sulphide. A green and white jockey cap shaded Lennon's eyes. Her shoes were bright green and highly polished. In the end, said Mustafa Mond, 
the controllers realized that force was no good. The slower but infinitely surer methods of ectogenesis, neo-Pavlovian conditioning, and hypnopedia. And round her waist she wore a silver-mounted green Morocco surrogate cartridge belt, bulging, for Lenin was not a free martin, with the regulation supply of contraceptives. The discoveries of Fitzner and Kawaguchi were at last made use of, an intensive propaganda against viviparous reproduction. Perfect, cried Fanny enthusiastically. She could never resist Lenina's charm for long. And what a perfectly sweet Malthusian belt! Accompanied by a campaign against the past, by the closing of museums, the blowing up of historical monuments, luckily most of them had already been destroyed during the Nine Years' War, by the suppression of all books published before AF 150. I simply must get one like it, said Fanny. There were some things called the pyramids, for example. My old black pattern bandolier. And a man called Shakespeare. You've never heard of them, of course. It's an absolute disgrace, that bandolier of mine. Such are the advantages of a really scientific education. The more stitches, the less riches. The more stitches, the less... The introduction of our Ford's first T-model. I've had it nearly three months. Chosen as the opening date of the new era. Ending is better than mending. Ending is better. There was a thing, as I've said before, called Christianity. Ending is better than mending. The ethics and philosophy of underconsumption. I love new clothes. I love new clothes. I love... So essential when there was underproduction, but in an age of machines and the fixation of nitrogen, positively a crime against society. Henry Foster gave it me. All crosses had their tops cut and became T's. There was also a thing called God. It's real Morocco surrogate. We have the world state now, and Ford's Day celebrations, and community sings, and solidarity services. Ford, how I hate them, Bernard Marx was thinking. There was a thing called heaven. <laughs> But all the same, they used to drink enormous quantities of alcohol. Like meat, like so much meat. There was a thing called the soul, and a thing called immortality. Do ask Henry where he got it. But they used to take morphia and cocaine. And what makes it worse, she thinks of herself as meat. Two thousand pharmacologists and biochemists were subsidized in AF-178. He does look glum, said the assistant predestinator, pointing at Bernard Marx. Six years later, it was being produced commercially, the perfect drug. Let's bait him. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. Glum, Marx. Glum? The clap on the shoulder made him start, look up. It was that brute, Henry Foster. What you need is a gram of soma. All the advantages of Christianity and alcohol, none of their defects. Ford, I should like to kill him. But all he did say was, No, thank you, and fend off the proffered tube of tablets. Take a holiday from reality whenever you like.
and come back without so much as a headache or a mythology. Take it, insisted Henry Foster. Take it. Stability was practically assured. One cubic centimeter cures ten gloomy sentiments, said the assistant predestinator, citing a piece of homely hypnopedic wisdom. It only remained to conquer old age. Damn you! Damn you! shouted Bernard Marx. Hoity toity! Gonadal hormones, transfusion of young blood, magnesium salts. And do remember that a gram is better than a dam! <laughs> they went out laughing. All the physiological stigmata of old age have been abolished. And along with them, of course... Don't forget to ask him about that Malthusian belt, said Fanny. Along with them, all the old man's mental peculiarities. Characters remain constant throughout a whole lifetime. Two rounds of obstacle golf to get through before dark. I must fly. Work, play. At sixty, our powers and tastes are what they were at seventeen. Old men in the bad old days used to renounce, retire, take to religion. Spend their time reading, thinking, <laughs> thinking. Idiots, swine, Bernard Marx was saying to himself as he walked down the corridor to the lift. Now, such is progress, the old men work, the old men copulate, the old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure, not a moment to sit down and think. Or if ever by some unlucky chance such a crevice of time should yawn in the solid substance of their distractions, there is always soma, delicious soma, half a gram for a half holiday, a gram for a weekend, two grams for a trip to the gorgeous east, three for a dark eternity on the moon, returning whence they find themselves on the other side of the crevice, safe on the solid ground of daily labour and distraction, scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl, from electromagnetic golf course to... Go away, little girl! shouted the DHC angrily. Go away, little boy! Can't you see that his fortune's busy? Go and do your erotic play somewhere else! Suffer, little children, said the controller. Slowly, majestically, with a faint humming of machinery, the conveyors moved forward thirty-three centimeters an hour. In the red darkness glinted innumerable rubies.